So I'm glad you had a good summer. And I think at this time of the year, we often uh, set goals, New Year's resolutions. Probably the majority of you have broken them by now. But that's all right. It's a place of forgiveness here this morning, isn't it? Um, and we set goals for ourselves. And we try to improve ourselves for the new year and, of course, a new decade. Uh, that's what the beginning of the year we generally do. So as I said, um, I saw in the new decade uh, overseas in Florida and in London. I was over in Florida um, suffering for Jesus at Disneyland um, at a conference where the 104 nations were represented doing work, doing work very similar to the work that I do in Howitt College. And it was an incredible experience. It's the best, apart from the River Conference, it's the best conference. Peter's in the house, so I've got to behave today. Um, it was the best conference, seriously, hands down, that I've ever been to. And some of you sitting there going, yeah, if I went to a conference at Disneyland, yeah. it would probably be the best conference I've ever been to. And a lot of you know that I'm like, I was going to say I'm a closet nerd, but like, that's not, not anymore. You know, no, no, I'm, I'm, you know, everyone knows that I'm a nerd. And so I loved everything to do with Disneyland, you know, like Mickey and Minnie came in when we were having dinner. I mean... <laughs> Ah, uh, my childhood, eh? Mickey and Vinnie come, hello, and they're like waving, and you become a child again, because <laughs> when Mickey waved at me, oh my gosh. And then, and then, and then, and then over the last week, prepare for the resistance, and then boom, 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 stormtroopers come in, and I'm like, ah! It was incredible. Um, but, aside, <laughs> but aside from all of that, it was the stuff that happened during the sessions that, like, no lightsaber or, you know, trip to Galaxy Edge, which was amazing, could ever live up to. It was what God was doing uh, in me in those sessions, which has changed my life and has um, added fuel to uh, the fire and added fresh vision and, and revelation. And God continued to say, it was really weird, in the first session, he said something to me. He said something through the speaker that was really random, but that God's been saying for the last three years to me. So I was slightly freaked. I was like, God's in America too. This is really strange. <laughs> um, and it was like word for word. It was like she was in my... Anyway, that was really weird. But um, yeah, it was what God was doing within me uh, at that conference that was worth traveling all those miles and being away from Emily for, for nearly a month. Um, although I did miss her and told her that. I'm never going anywhere without her again. Um, love you. It's good to be back. Anyway, um, I think uh, if you've done Enneagram, if you've been around Enneagrams or whatever, um, I'm a three, a very solid three. All the threes out there, yep. And I'm a bit of an eight as well. So literally that means that achievement is the name of the game for me. There's nothing else, moving forward, moving up, achieving, doing well. And I, I thought in, the, in, this, in this time that we find ourselves in, beginning of a year, we often think about ourselves, right? It's all about how we're gonna climb the corporate ladder or invest that money and get a better return or, or even improve ourselves. And that's what I was thinking about at the conference. Like, man, this is good. I'm so can I was, I'm just going to be so powerful when I come. But how at college isn't going to isn't going to know what's hit it. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, come on. And then God, you know how God? Um, I, I must confess to a really unchristian thought that I had on the plane. I was sitting beside possibly the most annoying person in the history of air travel. <laughs> And he got up to go to the bathroom, and there was a moment, there was a moment where I thought, just a foot, just a foot, slightly out <laughs> as he walks past, like I'm confessing, because church is a good place to confess, just a foot, just a foot, and he, he'll probably be quiet as he falls to the ground. <laughs> and God does that to us in a really nice, loving, fatherly way. Um, what I was going to do was not. And I didn't, so just so you know. But the thought was there. 
But God does that, stops us in our tracks. And when I was, you know, soaking, thinking I was just going to be God's answer to East Auckland and all that kind of stuff. (laughs) Uh, And he tripped me up. And he tripped me up through one story that we'll see later. Don't play it now, Chris. It's all good. I know you're ready to go. That we'll see later. Um, And completely arrested me and threw everything that I'd been thinking out the window in a really good way. And like I said, we, we focus a lot on ourselves. When we come to church, a lot of the times is, oh, will the worship suit me? Will the sermon suit me? Will this suit me? Will I like the people that I'm sitting beside? If you don't today, please don't let on. That's a bit, bit awkward. But we, it's all about us, right? And particularly at the beginning of a year, it is all about us. And self-improvement, investing well, um, climbing the ladder... That's a good thing. They're good things. But I actually think there's room for more. I think there's room for what I'd like to call Picasso's process. I think there's room for both yourself to improve, but for others to improve as well. For others to go forward. I believe there's room within your life this year and this decade to be the forerunner of someone else's future. Because it's not all about you. It's not all about me at the end of the day. We can engage in Picasso's process, which calls on us to find the gold, to call it out, and to walk with others in it. When we read Scripture... The story of scripture is filled, it's brimming with people who are the unlikely that God chooses to do the extraordinary. All throughout scripture. And in this room, I'm sorry, but um, you know, it is scriptural that God said, you you weren't that great when I called you, but it's the calling that makes you great in Christ. Ordinary, flawed, not yet perfect human beings. God chooses them by their thousands, their hundreds of thousands, not just in Scripture, but the continuation of the church of Jesus Christ. He chooses these people to, to, for both little and the large to change the world into the more perfect place that God is wanting. But it doesn't happen by accident. A lot of the time... We, we see people who are doing, who are daring greatly, who are doing amazing things for God, who, and, and, and by amazing things for God, I don't mean someone from the pulpit necessarily. I don't mean stuff that happens here in church. I'm talking about people that are doing great things, like talking to that person on the train who's crying and comforting them. That is a great thing. That is bringing God's shalom to that situation. That's what I mean by great. So so often we think of great as in consigned to this this part of the church. But as a very wise philosopher, Gandalf once said, (laughs) it's the small things that really count. The small things can do wonders in the hands of an obedient servant of God. But it, 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 this thing doesn't happen by accident, finding the gold. It just doesn't appear. It's a process. It's Picasso's process. Because to find the fault, to find the fault in the other, requires very little effort, skill, or investment because you're just seeing what's on the surface, generally. You're not skilled if you can pick up people's flaws. In fact, you're being lazy. What takes effort, what takes skill, what takes investment is finding the gold, however small, however much of a sliver it is in the other person. 
finding that thing that that person was born to be. And, and, and it bucks against everything that we've been told in culture. Everything we've been told in culture is that it's all about you. And unfortunately, we bring that into the church. And the way we do church is, I just want more of you, just for me, not for Stu, or anyone. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, it's subtle, but it's there, right? Sorry. <laughs> Forever you'll now be thinking, replacing you with Stu um, in songs. It's great. Um, it's difficult. It's a slog. It's, it's, um, I went to the Churchill War Rooms. I have nothing to offer you but blood, sweat, and tears. And that's what it is. It's a slog to find the gold in someone else. And it takes the focus off you. You're not center stage anymore. You're in the wings. But I believe that that's what God is calling us. That's who God is calling us to be as a people. Is to be the forerunner, to be the cheerleader, to be shoulders to stand on for somebody else's future. You know why it's difficult to find the gold in someone else? Because it requires us, it requires you to move toward the other person. And that's tricky. That's complicated. That's messy. That's not safe or comfortable. It also causes us to move away from our preconceived ideas and it reveals our heart of prejudice towards that person or towards those kind of people. The people of Israel had preconceived ideas and prejudices towards the Moabites, and some would say rightly so, because the Moabites were a pagan people. They worshipped uh, false gods, far removed from anything resembling a Jewish person. <coughs> so we have the story of Ruth in Scripture, and for, for those who aren't familiar with it, Ruth is not only a Moabite woman, but she ends up marrying a Jewish person. The tragedy strikes... Ruth's husband, her uh, father-in-law, and her brother-in-law all die. Leaving Ruth and her sister-in-law and her mother-in-law. But Ruth isn't like her sister-in-law. She stays with Naomi, with her mother-in-law, even though she doesn't have to. And she returns with Naomi to Naomi's homeland and to her people. Hungry and destitute, uh, Naomi says, well, maybe you should uh, head to the fields of Boaz, and uh, he's a relative, and quite good looking, no, I didn't say that, um, but uh, hey, hey, and um, maybe you should go and gather the grain that's left over, and so she does, and Boaz, Boaz is like, hey, hey, as well, hmm, who's that lady over there gathering the grain? That's an interpretation, the Lyle interpretation of uh, Ruth chapter 2, the early part. And then Boaz notices here, if you actually read the original, that's basically what he's saying. Anyway, just so you know that I'm not being naughty. Uh, Boaz notices her and he asks her to come over. And in Ruth chapter 2, uh, verses 10 to 11, we read, At this, Ruth bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. Notice how Ruth defines herself? A foreigner. And she's, it's not just any foreigner. That, that, that's not what she's meaning by her self-definition. She's meaning, don't you know that I'm a dirty, smelly Moabite? that Israelites hate. That's what she's meaning by foreigner. That's how she defines herself. And yet Boaz, he doesn't, even, he doesn't seem to pay attention to even Ruth's self-definition. He overlooks it and sees the gold. He overlooks the preconceived ideas and prejudices of his people. He overlooks the self-definition of Ruth even, and sees the gold. 
And some of us know the rest of the story. They end up falling in love and they have babies. And uh, not just that, but Ruth's great-grandson is King David. But not just that, she's in the family tree of Jesus. Incredible. Incredible. And all all because Boaz found the gold. Um, Some of you won't be surprised by this. Uh, Some of you may be, who are slightly deluded. Um, I was not always a polished preacher. (laughs) It's the laugh of recognition from Emily. Um, I I wasn't always a good youth worker. In fact, my life was a bit of a mess for a bit. But there was a certain woman called Lynn Campbell. And she's she's one of the reasons why I'm standing here today. Because in the mess, she saw a little bit of gold. And um, she, she got me to sort my life out really patiently, really lovingly, filled with grace. And she found the gold within my life. We need more limbs in this world. We need more people who will find the gold in your work, in your school, in your homes, in your, in your neighborhoods. Look for the gold. Look for the gold within people. It's so easy to rush to judgment. It's so easy to see the bad stuff in people's lives. But my, my request, my plea to you today is, even with the nastiest person that you encounter in your workplace or in your school or in your neighborhood or even in your home, find the gold. Commit to Picasso's process of finding the gold. However little, however small, because it will not only change that person's trajectory in life, it will change the lives of the people in that person's orbit, and it will begin to transform your heart. But we can't just find the gold. We can't just stop there. We need to call it out. According to the the National Science Foundation, an average person, so this is an average person. If If you don't fit within this, it's okay. It's all right. The average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. You're thinking, man, I don't know if I have that many thoughts. Well, that's one. So there you go. Well done. Just just another 11,999 to go. You'll get there. But of those thoughts that you have every day, 80% are negative. 80% are negative. No matter how positive or faith-filled we may be, there's a lot of negative self-talk that goes on in here, right? And most of us, if we're honest, and again, I've said this many times, but we need a reminder, I think. Good to be honest in church. If we're honest, most of us would say we we would fall into that 80%. Negative self-talk is caused by what people say to us, what people say over us, but it's also caused by our circumstances, what life throws at us, the stuff that's outside of our control. That forms a lot of the negative self-talk. In fact, I think, I believe that what people say and our circumstances become this ugly, circular thing that just, if we're not careful, can consume us and, and just pull us down. So often we see the bad in ourselves, right? So often we don't see the good, the good character, the good gifts, the the love that may be faint but is there. Most of the time we need other people to find the gold and to call it out. Uh, Esther, in the story of scripture, is a Jewish orphan girl and through a series of events she ends up married to the king. She's done well for herself in life, marriage to the king. And then Mordecai, her uncle, says, yeah, but you're married to the king, but don't tell anyone you're Jewish. Just keep that stum, you know. <laughs> then Haman, I mean, this is great, isn't it? It's like, oh, the stories in scripture are amazing. And they're true, too, which is, makes them even <laughs> crazier. Uh, Haman, the king's top advisor, got really annoyed because Mordecai didn't bow down. I mean, you're having a bad day. 
haven't had your coffee if you get annoyed that someone didn't bow down. I mean, it's a bit weird. But anyway, he, uh, and so it gets even worse. He's like, well, they didn't bow down, so I want to wipe out the entire Jewish people. And so the king's like, yep, sweet. You're my advisor. That's, yeah, go for it. So Esther finds herself in this predicament of, well, what do I do? You know? Um, and Mordecai's like, well, you need to reveal that you're Jewish, and then that might help save our people. And understandably, Esther hesitates. I mean, you can understand that, because she's fearful for her own life. And in Esther chapter 4, verses 12 to 14, we read, When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family will perish. And here's the kicker. Probably one of the most, the most famous verse from Esther and one of the most famous verses in all of scripture. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Some of us know how the story ends. The king cancels the kill order. The Jewish people are saved. And Haman, like all good baddies, is killed. So it's great. Star Wars, eat your heart out. Um, but you see what happened with Esther? If Esther's self-talk informed and influenced by the circumstances around her, led her to question the gold inside, led her to question that she was there for a purpose. So a lot of the time when we read the story, we think it was Esther that saved her people, but it wasn't. Mordecai saved his people by saving Esther. Saving Esther from not becoming all that she was meant to be. Saving Esther by reminding her not only of the gold that was there within her, but calling it out. It's a little bit awkward because Peter's here. I didn't think he'd be here today, but um, someone to talk about him. Uh, slightly positively. Um, it was two years ago, actually, at Christmas Eve, uh, that Peter had a conversation with me, and I'd just been made redundant from a church. Now, if you're going to make somebody redundant, don't do it the week before Christmas. It's just a bit, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't soften the blow. Um, <coughs> we can laugh about it now. Um, and Peter, Peter spoke to me, and that led to me here at the river, and Emily too. Yes, thank you. Peter's excited. That's good. I'm excited too. But um, not only that, it led me into what God has called me for for this season. Do you know that I'm only in Howitt College because of Peter? Do you know that, well, you're being modest. Do you know that Peter could have been like, well, I've employed you to be a pastor. We want you to be here for our reasons. We're not going to release you into Howitt College. But Peter told, said to me, um, I saw you in that... So we went and had a meeting, a, a um, preliminary meeting with Howitt College. And, and Peter wasn't too sure. And then he, he said, I saw you in the meeting and I saw that you were born to do this. And he said, whatever it takes we're going to get you in that school. And you know what? Everything that comes out of my ministry at that school is because Peter saw the gold and called it out and released me into what God was calling me to do. All the kids that are saved, all the kids that are impacted, all the kids whose lives are turned around are because this man chose to not focus on his own selfish needs, not that I saw, you know, <coughs> on his needs for the church to have a pastor, but release me into what God had for me. 
We need more people like Peter in the world, as well as people like Lynn. People that will call out the gold, find it and call it out in people's lives and release them into it. And so what does that look like for you? Because sometimes, because for me, because of the circumstances that I'd been in, it wasn't just redundancy, it was a really messy redundancy. And it made me question whether I was called to do anything for God. I'm a pretty confident guy, as some of you (laughs) may be aware. (laughs) I'm pretty confident, but I was at the end of my tether. I, I was like, I was almost done with church. Not with God, but pretty much done with church. Circumstances. Circumstances can affect that 80% of what's going, negative stuff that's going on in here. Sometimes we need someone to come into our circumstances and to pull us out of it. And this year, who are you going to do that for? There are people in your own home. There are people in your schools, in your workplace that are just waiting, just waiting for someone to go, I see the gold within you. And come forward. Come, let it come forth. Let me help you to bring that forth. Because we, as, imagine, if we as a church, if we as the River Church committed to the Picasso process, we'd change East Auckland. But not just that, we'd, we'd change Auckland. And it would seep out into the world. Because we're a pe- we, we would be a people that would be the forerunners of people's future. We would be the shoulders on which people could stand. So instead of being small, they can be giants and do terrific in both the little and the big for God and for his kingdom. We need more people like that in our world. But not only do we need to find the gold and call it out and walk with them through it, uh, and, and call, uh, find the gold and call it out, we need to walk with people through it. Uh, pretty easy claim to make, but I think Jesus was uh, a pretty good disciple maker. In fact, I think he was the best. I know, lofty claim. But he knew what he was doing. Now, you're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. And I've heard many times in Christian circles that uh, you've just got to be like Jesus. Well, hang on. Jesus as an example, just an example, will utterly crush you. Because you're not Jesus. You're human. You're flawed. But Jesus as your friend and your closest companion will give you the strength and the power so that you, that you desperately need to lead the life that he would have you to live. You can't just let Jesus be your example. You need to be close with him because that empowers you to live the life that you need to live. And so we see Jesus with his disciples, this ragtag bunch of losers, basically, most of them. I mean, would you pick, would you pick Peter? No, thank you. Peter is honest. Not that Peter. Oh, it's just a hole, isn't it? Um, no, one would have, no one would have picked him. He was a loud mouth. Hang on. Hang on. Um, yeah, and Doubting Thomas and, you know, the guys that didn't really do that much. And, uh, <laughs> and they went to sleep. I mean, for goodness sake. Oh, yeah, stay awake, watch. Yeah, keep awake. And they're all asleep. Um, but he picked them. Not only did he find the gold, not only did he call it out, he walked with them through it all. Even when he had to tell Peter, get behind me, Satan. I mean, that's a telling off, isn't it? You know you've done something wrong when someone says, get behind me, Satan. Um, <laughs> so if anyone says that to you, <laughs> you should know you're in trouble. Um, but he walked with them. He was patient with them. He showed them how to do it. And I think for me, one of the most beautiful moments in Scripture is John, in John 21, when Peter has denied Jesus three times, when he said he wouldn't. Can you, like, a lot of the time we just, like I've said this before, we just read Scripture and we don't really think 
because we're trying to get through our Bible in a year plan and all that stuff. I don't really think about it that much. Or, well, so, you know, we just, we read it and, it, and we, don't, we don't think that these are real human beings that, you know, we don't think beyond the text. And I think just how stink would Peter have been feeling? Raining? Got it. Like, how stink would Peter have been feeling when he's fishing? This guy, you know, like this person, Jesus, who he loved and he'd betrayed. And he's fishing. And then he sees someone on the bank. And he knows who it is. And we know Jesus had, you know, fire and barbecue with him. Peter, do you love me? And I think so often we're willing to run away from those that we start to find the gold in because they make mistakes. Um, they, they stuff it up. And I think, and you've invested, and it hurts, you know. But, but Jesus, our ultimate example, empowers us to go back, to go back and find Peter on the boat and go, come on, it's okay. Peter, do you love me? And that's the ultimate example of Jesus is the ultimate example of somebody who paid the ultimate price. And I'm not talking about the cross in this particular scenario. But he would pay, he would pay a heavy price to disciple those, those guys. To walk with them through the gold that he had found and called out. He paid a heavy price to do that. And, and this is like finding the gold, a little bit difficult. Calling it out, a little bit more difficult. But walking with someone with the gold that you've discovered and called out is the hardest, most inconvenient, stressful, frustrating part of the Picasso process. It's inconvenient, it's stressful, it's frustrating because newly discovered gold has to be cleaned got dirt all over it, muck, has to be cleaned, the impurities have to be removed, it's not perfect and it will make mistakes. Some, you have to show them the way, you have to be that close to them that you show them the way. Perhaps um, you've discovered, perhaps you've seen, perhaps you're a greeter and you've discovered that somebody is really good at interacting with people, but they're so enthusiastic that they go a little bit over the top. And it takes patience, it's annoying leading people. Peter's got his hand down, but he'd probably put his hand down. Anyway, um, it's, it is. It's, it's really inconvenient. But the world needs people who are forerunners of other people's futures. Not their own, but other people's future. So I'm entering a new season in my life. Things are going to start changing. Some of you may know Mike Terinsky. Mike Terinsky is the head of Young Life, which is the organization that employs me. And he's going to have to be doing a lot of this, walking with me through the changes that are happening in my life um, with our organization, with, with, with Young Life. But do you know the amazing thing about Mike Terinsky? Is that Mike not only sees the gold, not only does he call it out, but he commits to the process of seeing the person become all that God has called them to be. And I'm so grateful to have uh, someone like Lynn, to have someone like Peter, and to have someone like Mike Terinsky in my life. Because without it, I would not be the man that I am today, or the man that God has me to become. And now, it's interesting the way that sermon writing works. Everybody has a different process. <coughs> Excuse me. And I had, I had this title before I left. So it was probably two months. There was this title floating around in my head, the Picasso process. And, uh, and it wouldn't leave my brain. But it was that, that was it. It was only a title. And I was like, thanks, God. Just a title. It would be nice if there was some just three points or just a sniff at what you want. Um, but on the last day in London... So this was 
four days ago. <laughs> um, I picked up a newspaper, this one, uh, and I was on the tube, and I was thinking about all I'd experienced in Florida and London, and <coughs> excuse me, and kind of freaking out a little bit about what I was to preach, because I had no idea. All I had was the Picasso process running around in my brain. And then I opened the newspaper. I was like, oh, page two. Sitting on the tube, I was going to do the crossword, but um, <laughs> um, oh, so, I loved London. Um, anyway, and I saw page two. Picasso work at age nine prove he's, proves he's a cut above. I thought, oh, that's quite interesting, isn't it? The last day in London, there's an article on page two about Picasso. I thought, oh, I should probably read that. And um, the article goes on to say that at the age of nine, uh, Pablo Picasso created these cutouts of a wolf and a, some other animals. And they were, on, they were going to be on display at uh, the Royal Academy. Interesting, I thought. Uh, but then the article describes uh, Pablo's parents, particularly his father who encouraged him into art. And there it was. I was like, finally, last day in London, I've got my sermon. I know what the Picasso process is. Pablo Picasso was one of the most influential artists of the 20th century. Most of us have heard and know his name. But Jose Ruiz Blasco, not so much. None of us really know. I didn't until I read his name in this newspaper. He was Pablo Picasso's father. And without Jose, this person that we don't know, we didn't know his name, this person standing in the wings, because he saw the gold, the potential in Pablo, because he called it out and because he walked with him through it, we have Picasso. We have one of the most influential artists in the 20th century. And his father is largely forgotten. So I'm going to, Chris is going to put on a video very soon. Um, if we could drop those lights, that would be great. Yep, thank you. So just a little bit of a. Um, just so you understand the video a little bit, Young Life is the, organi the global organization that I belong to, and they do similar work to what I do in Howitt College. That's uh, working with people that are at, young people that are at risk and um, trying to bring some wholeness into their life. And when they talk about camp, camp is a place where young people get to go and hear about Jesus for the first time. So if we could drop those, can we drop those, the big spots? Yep, and um, thank you, Chris. Zachary loves people and he loves Jesus. He loves to serve. Zachary has Down syndrome. Sometimes he calls it up syndrome. Zachary's mom was a teen mom and Zachary was her second child. She was on her own when she found out he had Down syndrome. It was a scary, lonely time. I feel hard to have a job and have me and my sister. The first time he came to Young Life, we realized pretty quickly that Zachary knew Jesus. He just had not found a place where he could grow in his faith and where he could really become a disciple and exercise his gifts. I love Jesus so much uh, because he, he has forgiven my sins and he died for me. God is my amazing father. I think it was the first place that Zachary really belonged was in, in Young Life. We had a, a friend who has a disability who shared he needed prayer that he would find friends who would see him for who he is. As he talked about it, I said, Zachary, would you like to pray for Joey? And so he said, yeah. And then there was this, I'm driving, there's this long pause of silence. And at one point I said, Zach, are you going to pray? And he said, first I listen to Jesus and see what he wants me to pray. Zachary listens to Jesus. I know Jesus is speaking to me in heaven. I feel it, I feel it in, in my heart. Uh, I have to listen to him because he He's my father.
Zachary works at a local grocery store. He's a bagger. He loves his job, people love him, and he realized that the freedom he had with that job was not just to go to the movies and go out to eat, but that he had plenty to give away. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. I like uh, with money, 14 moms and babies to go to camp for their first time. As he does, he's praying for the teen mom that he'll get to send to camp over the summer. I waste money for Jessica to go to camp for her first time. Raising money to go to camp isn't easy because that's like not the first thing that you would save all this money to go towards this. No, I save all my money to go towards my son. Zachary didn't want to just pay for a Young Lives girl to go to camp. He wanted to be part of the child care team because of his love for babies. And so he hopped on a bus and headed up to Woodleaf. And he was matched with Jessica's little boy, Damien, as only God could have arranged it. One day I happened to stop into Zach's nursery where he was working and he's holding Damien. And I thought, wait a minute, Zach is Damien's caregiver? Because I wasn't in charge of that. Seeing someone sponsor me and I got to build a connection with them. It's so amazing how my son looks at Zach. And I see God's work right there because that's love. It's worth it. I got to teach my life too. Jesus loves me. I like how Jesus loves Damien. And um, Damien is his son too. Why? Because that's um, Damien's father. I don't love him so much. I would love to be a premium buddy ever since I met Zach, you know. I am so grateful. It's amazing to have people like Zach in this world. Zachary has been a partner to me in ministry. When he speaks, people hear and listen. I think there will be barriers broken in terms of how kids with disabilities are treated wherever his story is told. It was one of the, um, uh, I watched it enough times that I, um, I was like, I have to, I'm not gonna, I'll be okay. Um, it was one of the honors of my life to, uh, to meet Zach, and I got to meet him and give him a hug. He's a very good hugger. Um, and to spend some time with him and to hear his story. And that was one of the, uh, some of you may have seen it on Facebook. For me, it was the greatest moment um, at conference. And like building a lightsaber, that was cool at Disneyland. Um, uh, hearing amazing speakers from all around the world, seeing uh, thousands of people, like 6,000 people. Um, but we had worship in languages that were in English. Um, we had, and I was singing Spanish. Um, who knew I could sing Spanish? Um, and then Zach's story was told and he came up and shared and prayed for us and led us in worship. And it was one of the most beautiful things, experiences. It was, um, it was like a foretaste of heaven. And in fact, one of his buddies, the, Cap the Capernaum program is a program in young life for people with disabilities. And one of his, one of his friends uh, closed the conference in prayer. And it was, one of the, it was a way better prayer than I've ever prayed. Um, and to, to see this flesh and blood example of somebody like Zach, who, who the society had told him the only place that you really have is not a real, healthy, functioning place. Society told him, yeah, we'll tolerate you, but that's about it. And the people of God told him, no, you have a part to play, man. You need to find that part that you have to play, and you, that part you have to play, and you need to play it well, and, and we'll help you. And, and for me, I thought, um, Zach was the hero in the story. And I was wrong. And as I was sitting on the tube about to do my crossword, I thought, no. The hero of the story isn't Zach. The hero of the story is Kristen. The lady um, that you saw in the video, and she spoke to at conference, she was the one who saw the gold, in spite of everything else that other people would have seen. 
She saw the gold in Zach. She was the one who called it out, and she is the one that continues to walk with him through it. And that's the Picasso process. The Picasso process is taking the focus off us and putting it on somebody else. Taking the time and the energy and the inconvenience to look beyond all our petty stuff, all our wantings to succeed, which isn't a bad thing, but if that's all you got, you're going to live a really lonely, hollow life. Not the kind of life that God wants for you. It's not being in the spotlight, but it's being in the wings, watching with, with unbridled joy as that other person, as people like Zach saw. So at the beginning of this year, and as I invite the, uh, I'd invite the uh, music team to come up, so at the beginning of this year, I would like to encourage us as a people, encourage us as the River Church, to commit to the Picasso process. It's a process that's difficult, that's hard, that's inconvenient, that will expose your heart, yet transform it. Look for the gold in someone else. Call it out and walk with them through it. Show them how it's done. And if you can't show them how it's done, find someone else that can show them how it's done. Whether it's um, talking in front of people or teaching them how to change a tire on a car. We think that that's so small, yet it can be so massive. Because the world needs more Christines in it. The world needs more Jose's in it. Because without them, we don't have the Picassos. And we don't get the Zacks. So I'd like to invite the, um, the ministry team to come to the front now. So often altar calls, altar calls are great. Altar calls are great to deal with stuff that, uh, that's going on for you and to, fit and to have a touch and encounter with God. And, and, and this, this place is open for, will be open for that after this moment. But this moment, I want to focus, I want us to focus on uh, the Picasso process. Maybe God is speaking to you today about a person, maybe a person in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, even in your school. And you know that God has put that person on your heart, that person that you can find the gold, call it out and walk with them through it. So I'd just like to invite you to stand this morning. And if God is speaking to you about committing to that process this year and this decade even, to committing to that process of finding the gold, calling it out and walking with that person through it, I'd like to invite you to come and to receive prayer that Jesus wouldn't be just your example, but he would be your closest friend and your strength uh, to to walk in the Picasso process. This is a moment to take the attention off yourselves. So often I think that we we have these kind of moments in it, and it is a little bit towards ourselves, and we need those times. But this is a place, this is a time for us to consider the Zacks and the Pablos of this world. So I invite you, if God is speaking to you,